All right, you guys, this is the documentary I've been talking about like crazy. I posted on social media this morning, and people got into a conversation back and forth, convincing their friends they've got to go on Netflix right now to watch it. It's called Abducted in Plain Sight. It's streaming on Netflix right now. Sky Borgman, who is the director of the documentary. Hi, Sky. How are you? Welcome to my show. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Um, let me give read this little piece of paper here um, so people get an idea who haven't. Uh, heard of this or watched it yet. It's a documentary about a girl who gets kidnapped by a child molester named Robert Burstold. I can't pronounce any of his names. Not once, but twice. It involves aliens, arson, a fake therapist, Mormonism, and the world's most ill-advised handjob. It is the craziest true story I have heard in a very long time. Just when you think you go like, wow, this is a crazy story, then it brings four more elements of crazy to it that you can't even believe it's real. Sky, how did you um, find this story? Yeah, it was really the book that the Brobergs wrote uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, they self-published it, so it didn't get a huge wide release. But our producer, uh, Stephanie Toby, found the book through a mutual friend and was introduced to Jan Broberg, and they started talking. And Jan was like, well, you know, should we tell my story to try to get the word out about child abuse? And Stephanie came to me because she had never really done a documentary before and said, you know, could we do this? Is this something you think would be good? And I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. I read the book. I was, I had the same reaction that everybody's having. I was like, how could this happen? This is completely crazy. And so I just kind of really wanted to figure out how something like this could happen. I was grateful that everyone you can tell, of course, is speaking their truth. They're not holding back. And that's what was so mind-blowing. Like, hey, um, I don't know if I would have been able to come out and confess the things the parents have come out with. Were you oh, blown away no with that? way I would have. <laughs> no, no, no way. I mean, it's, yeah. so, it's so hard to talk about without getting uh, giving too much away, but I almost don't even care out of selfishness. Um, yeah. What what was it like to sit across from her mother? Because so many people blame the parents, uh, Bob and Mary Ann. Do, do they deserve that blame? Let me start there. I, I don't think they do. Um, but I, I can also understand uh, why people are blaming them, because I think it's really, really hard to kind of turn that mirror around and yep. look at ourselves and what we could possibly do. I sitting in the room with them during those interviews was so hard. I mean, it was such an emotional room. You know, we were all crying at times. Um, we were laughing at times too, but they were, they were long interviews, you know, they were eight or 10 hour long interviews. So it was a lot of, kind of deep, dark secrets exposed over a long amount of time. And it was just, it was really emotional. It was really wonderful. It was really, um, vulnerable. I felt completely honored mm -hmm. that they shared this with me, but it was, it was horrible. I mean, it was, it, it was the first time really that Marianne and Bob Roberg had really talked about their sexual indiscretions in a very public way. And I believe in my heart of hearts that they did that because they knew that these were two very important pieces to the puzzle yep. that they hadn't really talked about before because in the book, they left both of those instances out. Wow. So they reveal that yeah. in the documentary and not the book. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I did not know that. And it's been 10 years. Yeah. Like it had been 10 years or even more now, you know, since they put the book out. So I think they had another, you know, they had their first, attempt at putting this story out there and this first backlash kind of, you know, that I'm sure they got with the book, although not on such a grand scale that they're getting it now, you know. I know. Uh, and Bob's I, Bob's tears, the husband, father, was so painful to watch. What was it like in the yeah. room with him? Oh, it was, I mean, magnify that by 100% because I was just sitting behind the camera just crying with him and Stephanie was there and we were all just crying. And, you know, when you get into that situation, all you want to do is kind of step in front of the camera and give him a hug and, and just be with him. But, but he was really committed to telling his story. And afterwards, I think he was a little bit shell shocked after we finished the documentary and we're sitting around, I think eating hamburgers afterwards. And, uh, and he said, you know, I can't, I can't believe I, I told you that. And, and we just told him that we were really, really thankful that he did. 
I'm glad that they didn't come back and say, take it out, because that's a huge puzzle. Even the police and the FBI, I should say the FBI more than the police, said we could have had this guy locked away um, long mm-hmm. before if they would have been honest about their discretions. Um, is Bob st- and, and, and Marianne, are they still married? So, yes, they were still married. Bob passed away in November. No. So that makes things especially hard for all of his girls, for Jan and Karen and Susan and Marianne, especially just kind of all of the backlash that he's been getting and that Marianne's been getting. Um, although I guess the silver lining is that he doesn't really have to to right. see it, exactly. you know, to experience it himself. But it's so hard on his girls. I mean, I wonder if I should give that part away in case people haven't seen that part. I don't think it would take it away from viewers. I, 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 I don't think it will either. I don't think so either. So how would you, let me give, since you're the director, can you explain Bob and Marianne's discretions? Yes. So um, throughout, we we find out that, that Jan has been kidnapped, kind of the way the documentary is structured. We found out that she's been kidnapped. And then we kind of go back in time a little bit to look at the sequence of events that kind of led up to this this brainwashing and this manipulation. And so we find out that, Bob, Jan's dad, gets into a sexual interaction with Birchtold in a car. He gives him a hand job, essentially, and is kind of convinced to give him a hand job. And this is their neighbor, everybody. This is a neighbor that moved in with his own family who have who he seduced them into thinking he was a great guy and like a trusted neighbor and a friend and then started having an affair with Marianne and Bob separately separately and at different times too he started sort of laying the groundwork i think with marianne before the kidnapping and then and then convinced bob into this masturbatory act kidnaps jan and nobody nobody thought he was a bad guy at all like he had five kids he was married he was you know like just they had a little bit more money so he had all these fun toys he had a trampoline in the backyard. He had a motorcycle. He had boats. He he was the fun dad. You know, they'd go out and they'd do all this stuff together. And I think Bob felt that way too. He was a business owner and somebody that he really connected with and they had a lot of things in common. And so he was he was getting this this best friend. You know, and I get that because again, it's really hard to think like a crazy person when you're not. You know what I mean? These right. people were very an innocent family, very naive and gullible. They were perfect targets. I mean, never in their wildest imaginations did they even have that thought. When, when never. now in hindsight they said, oh my God, my, this guy that lived next door comes over and wants to build a wall separation in my daughter's room. So one of my daughters, so both of my daughters have their own individual rooms now so I can go in and molest one of them. I mean, like... That would be a big red flag for me. Yeah, I know. But then at the same time, I sit there going, you know, if my dad wasn't handy and and his best friend or his brother came over and said, oh, these True two that. girls, they're getting, they're getting older. Shouldn't they have their own rooms? And then your little girls are saying, oh, daddy, I want my own room. I want my own room. It'd be great. You're I right. mean, there's red flags. You're right. You're totally right. Hindsight, but at the same time, I sit there going, building a wall? How bad can that be? You know, I mean, I think there are other bigger red flags. Totally. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. There's a lot more red flags. I mean, let's go back to a little bit with Marianne, because that's the one where I'm like, as a mother, I'm trying to dissect her psyche a little bit. She still looked like, and you can tell me because you interviewed her, she still looked like she was, there was part of her that's still in love with B. Yeah, I know. I, You know, it's funny because a lot of people have said that, and... And I go back and I look at these interviews, and to me, I, I agree. I, I, I hear where people are coming from, but I always thought that was sort of this coping mechanism, really, that she's she's talked about it pretty openly for at least 15 years now. And even before that, she had talked about it with Bob, her husband Bob pretty openly, and her daughters pretty openly. So she's had a lot more experience talking about it and I think dealing with it and filtering through it. And what I see when I, I watch that interview is, is a kind of distancing and remorse and a coping mechanism, kind of a judgment of herself and how she felt at that time. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, 
I, I mean, I'm old enough to have been, I have the wisdom of having some empathy being in a lonely marriage in the past and right. knowing mm-hmm. and the desire to be touched and wanted and loved and, yeah. and have some spark back. There's like, uh, there's nothing like it. It's a drug. So yeah. of course, and she, how do you take away those feelings? They were real, you know? Despite- yeah. And I think she was at a point in her marriage. I mean, they're 13, 14 years into the marriage. They've got three kids it's just at one of those critical points in a marriage where the sex is probably gone or at least pretty sparse and you start, somebody comes along and they make you feel sexy again. They make you feel attractive. They make you feel like a woman. And, and I think for me, I could, I could understand how something like like that could happen. Yep. And by the way, for those that haven't seen it, this guy did this to manipulate the parents so he could take their daughter away, take her to Mexico, take her to get married at the age of 12, I think. 12 or 14? Yeah, 12. 12. 12. Let me ask you about Jane specifically. I mean, how she was able to be so articulate, grounded. Um, I'm sure she's still going through it. But she seems like she's done a lot of therapy or work on healing that's what I got my perception of it was Jan is amazing I mean it really when I you know you meet her and you wouldn't know any any of her past at all and then when you talk to her and you get insight into her past and what she's been through it does hit you like a ton of bricks how incredible she is and how strong she is and let me tell you something her capacity for forgiveness is on a whole different level because she is just one of the kindest, most generous people and committed to really getting the word out there about child abuse and that it's happening with somebody you know and trust. And I think that's where, that's where the disconnect happens for a lot of people because, you know, I have to tell you one thing that Jan said to me that has always stuck with me is she said, okay, tell me about your favorite uncle, you know, and immediately I think about my uncle Charlie and how much I love him and how amazing he is and all of these amazing feelings start coming back and he's passed away now. So it's even bigger. And then, you know, so you think about it for a couple of minutes and then she said, now imagine him raping you. Oh. And I just go, Oh my God. And that has stuck with me so much that this guy was, they had no idea. And that's how it happens is it's somebody that you know and trust and love and you never for a minute think about it until it's 10 years later or 20 years later or 40 years later. Hopefully you're able to look back and see it. And for those of you that, again, that haven't seen it, when he kidnaps her, she's drugged. She wakes up in like a Winnebago and is locked and tied up to a bed in the back with a recorder next to her ear with a recording of alien, quote unquote, voice that's saying you have been, you know, selected to do a mission and you must procreate and go do this mission and have a baby with this human being. A male will be selected. And she's like, what the fuck? She gets out of her ties and she goes in the other room and sees B. Now, this has been the neighbor and she thinks that he's also been kidnapped. So now she feels like, oh, good. I have a teammate with me in this she's 12 she doesn't know any better so she's completely mind fucked and manipulated into falling in love with this guy and her love letters sky her love letters to this guy broke my Mm. heart i know i know yeah and just seeing that little 12 year old handwriting in those letters it's just i know i i remembered writing letters like that when i was 12 to to other 12-year-old boys that I never sent, you know, and you just, her her youth, I think, really comes out in those letters. Did Do we know, like, with um, Jan, did she get, did she become uh, destructive? Did she get into drugs? Did she, was she sexually active after this? How did it manifest? Yeah, it, you know, it really, for her, and we don't go into this into the documentary, but, but she loved acting, and a big reason why she loved, I mean, she loved acting before this happened, but she really, really, really focused on acting after it happened because she could escape and because she could become somebody else. So it was this really formulative time 
for her, this 12, 12, 13, 14 year time span in her growing up. And she got back into acting, but she never, she never did drugs. She never really became sexually exploring anything until later, but she never really lashed out. I think she really sort of kept it in and then really got it out in, in acting. I, I'm so glad because it is a perfect occupation if you want to <laughs> numb your way through it without alcohol. <laughs> you just become someone else. Um, I'm talking to Sky Borgman. The, the, the docu- documentary is called Abducted in Plain Sight. It's on Netflix. It's buzzing. I got to tell you, when I posted it this morning, people are like, oh, my God. Everyone's watching. I think it's going to sky, you know, what's that word I'm looking for? It's going to get bigger and bigger and just explode into one of those documentaries that where everyone has seen it. I want to ask a little bit about the family. Was uh, How did the family deal with all of this? How are they doing it now that it's so public? The sisters, it's hard. It's yeah. really hard on them. Um, but they're, they're champs. I mean, I don't know that... that any of us really knew how big it was going to become. And uh, from the very beginning, I kept saying, we want to start this conversation. It's a hard conversation to start, but let's start talking about child abuse and let's start talking about how it happens. And, and everybody was 1 million percent on board for that, all of the family. And so that's happening now. And in a massive, massive way. And it's hard because I think the girls are trying to protect Marianne for a lot of what's happening on social sure. media. Yeah. And they're pretty able to do that. I mean, you know, Marianne's not on Twitter. I don't think, um, you know, she goes on Facebook and checks it, but, but the girls are kind of fielding a lot of questions. They're doing a huge amount when there's a lot of backlash against Bob or Marianne to kind of get on there and not be angry, but kind of explain things to people. And they've just been really incredible at talking. And Jan, too, has just been able to try to give a little bit more insight into why this happened. Where is B now? Where is this monster? He He's passed away. I mean, he... Oh, he did die. Didn't the documentary? Sp- That's right. He, you did show them yeah. he died. Yeah. Yeah. So um, his family is still around. And, and I just... I... I can't imagine what they're going through either. I mean, to have all of this brought back up again must be incredibly hard for them as well. And the other women that he supposedly did this to. Are you ever thinking about going over to them and asking, hey, you want to tell your story? Well, we did. While we were working on this one, there were um, a couple of women that we had known about, that the Brobergs really had known about, and they put us in contact with a couple of them, and and they weren't really interested in telling their story. This is before Me Too came along, right? So Me Too kind of happened at this time so that women and men are are getting their voices back and using their voices and and not feeling the shame right. that I think we did five years ago. I mean, it hasn't been that much, two, three years ago, really. So so it might be different now. Right. But at the time when we were reaching out, they didn't really want to talk to us. The Birch Tolls weren't interested in dredging this back up again. And Joe was the only member of the Birch Tolls family that was interested in telling his brother's side of the story. So... They're not that interested or weren't, um, but I have to tell you, just from the film being out there, so many women and a couple of men have reached out to me and told me through emails, um, through messages about their story. And when we were on the festival circuit with the film, I w- almost 100% at every single screening we had, somebody came up to me or yes. Emily or Stephanie and shared their story, sometimes for the first time, like they've never talked oh. about it before. So it's just, I have such hope right? that this film can Shifts. spark something great. I, I think absolutely. Yeah. You're shifting the planet. Sky Borgman, you did an amazing job telling their story. Abducted in Plain Sight is the name of it. Uh, you guys check it out. It's on Netflix right now. Congratulations on just really doing an amazing job. And if you can, send the family my love. Not that they'll care. But send them my love anyway. They will care. Okay, no, good. Thank you so much. They totally care. Much love, Sky. Thanks so much. Yeah, you too. Thank you. We'll be right back, guys. I had a way there. 